Uh, my personal experience is that of being Native Hawaiian. I was born and raised within a Native Hawaiian community, but in all my years, and I have lived uh, actually a good part of my life within a few miles of I-29 and, and within these Northern Plains states, uh, every Native American person I have uh, met has had very similar experiences to my own and uh, our communities as well. So I relate far more to Native Americans than uh, to Asian cultures, but not that I, you know, my father was actually first generation Chinese and I'm mixed race, but my mother was Hawaiian. So guess who ruled the household? <laughs> In any case, uh, let me get started. I've got two computer things going on here, so uh, uh, let me get started with this. I don't want to mess up this other computer. First of all, talking about indigenous research methodology. The first thing that came to me, mind to me, is, is the difference, the differences that we're, we're looking at as, uh, as researchers looking at indigenous peoples. The other thing, as an uh, instructor of a number of different multicultural college courses, um, many of them will tell you that that's one of the most heavily criticized courses, and most of them feel like uh, teaching multicultural courses is like being put in front of a firing squad. I'm not sure why that is, but I think it's because you're trying to convey so many different ideas and values to people who are very set in their ways of thinking and their belief systems, and they're not necessarily open to the differences that exist among different people's cultures and, and things. And so when you approach them with these new and different ideas, uh, a lot of people's initial tendency is to be standoffish and, and to reject these new ideas. And so I think that's why multicultural instructors get a bad rap. But so I don't want to talk about race and ethnicity yet. But what I am going to do is present you with a metaphor which is very much in the native uh, way of conveying knowledge and wisdom. Uh, so what I have selected as a metaphor are apples and oranges. So I want you all to give some thought now to uh, apples and oranges. And this is a rhetorical question, but you know, it's not that personal, so go ahead and raise your hand. How many of you have experience with apples? You might have eaten them. Some of you might have had apple trees in your yard growing up. Um, some of you may be uh, more adept with horticulture and appreciate the environmental conditions in which it takes an apple to grow and, and a tree to be productive. So the apple tree would be um, our native communities and the apples, are we as na individual natives. No, I'm sorry. Apple trees would be communities, apples would be the dominant uh, individuals among society. So. Let's switch from, how many of you have experiences with oranges? Okay, how many of you have had a tree in your yard or have grown oranges? Uh, I don't see many hands. Okay, there, Paige in the back, she's from Florida. So um, there you go, see, and that's like the native population. We're just very few of us. So many of you may have eaten oranges and that I would equate to people who know or have seen native communities or know native people and uh, have experienced the culture in some way, but by no means uh, have you grown an orange tree or had one in your yard or, you know, you're not really even familiar 
uh, really with the environment in which orange trees, the climate in which orange trees need to grow and thrive. And so if you think of those two different fruit, the apples and the oranges, and, and how, what different uh, circumstances are necessary for each of those trees or communities to grow and thrive, and how different the characteristics of the fruit itself are. One's crunchy and, um, you know, and the other one is, uh, and you don't have to peel an apple if you don't want to. The other one, you have to peel because orange peels, you know, the uh, pith is bitter and, and they're juicy and squishy. They're very, very different. They're both fruit. They're both sweet. And they make a wonderful fruit salad, but we're not at the fruit salad point just yet. So I want you to hold this metaphor in mind as I step you through the things that I feel are important about indigenous and indigenous methodology. Um, and I, I want you to keep also foremost in mind if there's one thing that you take away from this course today, is remember these two small words, who benefits. That should always be foremost in your mind when, especially when considering working with indigenous people or applying indigenous methodology to research. So who benefits? Now remember, none of what I say is intended to be offensive. Some of what I say might sting a little, but you know, history is history. We've all been on the receiving end of both the good and the bad, and so none of what I'm saying is intended to be political in nature or directed in any way to offend and if you feel that sensibility coming up, whether you're native or whether you're non-native, please refer back to my metaphor of the apples and the oranges because I happen to like both fruit. Sometime I'm not in the mood for one, but in the mood for another, and I do love the fruit salad. So, uh, you know, please take what I'm saying with a grain of salt because I am, I don't, I think politics tends to infuriate people, but. There are some facts that I have to bring to light in uh, sharing my knowledge of indigenous and indigenous methods with you. And so I introduce it this way because I hope you will appreciate that I honor every one of you for staying. <laughs> and, and most of the room has cleared out, but anyway. Um, what's the definition of indigenous methods? Well, Linda Tuhi Weissmith, who is one of the foremost scholars, um, indigenous scholars, and specifically in regard to methodologies, uh, she said that indigenous methodologies, methodologies tend to approach cultural protocols and values and behaviors as an integral part of methodology. So in essence, what she's saying is our methodologies are part of who we are, they are how we are, they are what we are, and they are how we do things. And that's what she's saying. Um, and then there are several characteristics which you can see listed on the screen that are considered part of indigenous methodologies. However, um, I will note right up front, and I'll get to the difference between the two, uh, that these characteristics that are noted here are indigenous methodologies, and you're gonna see a lot of overlap between indigenous and indigenous methods. And so I will speak to that more. First of all, Indigenous methods were a way to classify a methodology that was outside of, of dominant paradigms. 
and generally related to peoples that were not of the dominant society or culture. You can consider it to be a framework, and I might have reversed these slides a little, so let me, okay. So indigenous methods are a framework for research with native people. They, uh, they're about research strategies, they're about learning, they're about generating a knowledge base. Uh, they are very, very importantly about relationships of trust with people who are different fr from ourselves. And they are um, derived from established ways of knowing. So I'm going to come back to that other one. So this framework of indigenous methods, it's not really a method in and of itself, but it's more of a framework to use to augment other types of methods. But in this framework, it enables us to understand our human processes, and it uh, helps with the transmission of knowledge and makes meaning through emergence of knowledge into self-determining self uh, ways and it also creates space for indigenous knowledge to be present in the world. So the difference between indigenous methods, which is really basically a framework for augmentation of other methods, and indigenous methods is political. Make no bones about it. Okay, it's political. And indigenous methods are really more of a research paradigm. So indigenous methods have four basic aspects to that research paradigm. First, they are ontological. And what that means is they relate to the ways that a particular culture or society um, perceives the world that around them and, and, and their, the way they are in the world, their way of being. Secondly, they are epistemological. And that word is a tongue twister and a mouthful, but basically it means how we know what we know, how we learn and how we come to know things. The third aspect, of the paradigm is methodology. And it's about um, the principles and rules that organize the system of inquiry. And the fourth one is axiology. And that is about the values and the ethics and the judgment or the rules in which we apply to this way of uh, gleaning information. So you need to keep those four things in mind. Typically, uh, Western concepts do not put these four things together, but Native worldviews do. These are the four fundamental and integral components of the Native worldview. And um, they all are circular in nature. Each one relates to another. And I actually had a little graphic um, from an article, but for whatever reason, I couldn't capture the photo. But basically, it was a circle with ontology and an arrow going to epistemology and an arrow going to methodology and an arrow to axiology and back to ontology because it's, they're all interconnected, interrelated. And they're, so they're all part of that native worldview. And remember, if you're not following me, think back to that orange and that apple. It'll come together for you soon, but I'm just trying to put out the pieces and parts before I put them all together. Okay. So indigenous methodology. Douglas and Mustakas said that the most objective statement one takes is a most objective assessment 
is one that takes the personal viewpoint fully into account. So here is one of the fundamental differences between indigenous or indigenous methodology between most Western scientific methods. The researcher is not separate from the research. There's no such thing as arm's length research in indigenous or indigenous methods, okay? They are part and parcel of that research process. Okay, sorry, this isn't responding to me. Okay, so I explained what indigenous methods were. Now we're gonna take a closer look at some of the principles of indigenous methodology. First of all, it's a methodology that recognizes the native worldview and it acknowledges native people's realities. And, and, and for native people, those are really vital to their existence because it's how they understand their beingness in this world. Secondly, it honors native people's social mores. And these are essential processes to them. It's how they situate themselves um, within their frame of reality, where they are, who they are, what they're about. And for native peoples, place, is really a significant part of that. Their homelands are really significant to who they are. For me, I'm from one of the remote, one of the most remote land masses on the planet. I'm an island person. And if you think of what that really means, and some of you who are from this vast continent can't even appreciate it, you know, way back when, uh, the ancient Hawaiians really had to understand their environment and be intimately connected with it in order to survive in such a remote place. But the same holds true for native peoples. You know, when Westerners first came and made contact here on the continent, they uh, saw things through their own lenses, their own uh, values and, and paradigms, and so they interpreted it in, in their way, according to their culture. But, and what they saw was these natives who, who would uh, live in these more or less non-permanent structures and, and move from place to place and who didn't uh, have agricultural resources to support themselves and their lifestyles and, and they, you know, they really interpreted native peoples and culture in a certain way. But you know, they, they were wrong. Uh, the native peoples also were very sophisticated and complex in their thinking, in their culture, in their ways of being. They weren't nomadic so much um, as they, they knew that in order to cultivate their agriculture, they knew that they had to go where the best conditions were. So they would follow the seasons, they would follow the crops, they would plant and cultivate in areas that were fertile and friendly to those, uh, those types of vegetation or those animals. Think back to my apples and oranges. They don't grow in the same climates or the same places. So the native people would go there. Uh, Western convention, Eurocentric culture and society, you know, they, they found ways to um, propagate their agricultural methods and so forth. But, you know, they came and uh, in Europe, they, they tried to plant in places that were not conducive to what they were doing. And they, as a culture, as a society, they've constantly um, challenged the ways of nature and and in many cases they've succeeded 
but they've primarily done so because that's what they wanted to do. So it was very um, culturally driven uh, how they lived and how they did things. And so this is significant because, again, I'm speaking to the worldview and the different ways of thinking. So coming back to indigenous methodology, you know, this methodology honors the way in which native people think and how they value things. It's also political in that it was intended to privilege native voices because too often they were silenced or marginalized. And, um, and that again was due to cultural misinterpretations due to people thinking that they knew better than another. And the reality is uh, native peoples are literally the first peoples of the planet. They have sustained themselves and their societies for millennia. And that is seldom taken into account. So this indigenous methodol methodology, if you will, this process was developed as an emancipatory process to, to liberate and give privilege to those voices that have far too long gone unrecognized within uh, more dominant types of uh, circles, not just in academia, but in many different types of disciplines and, and forums. And on that note, one of the other things it does is it, it does place an emphasis on those socio-political contexts from which they were derived. So it's basically Native people's way of standing their ground. And I'm speaking to those with brown faces in this room. Stand in your shoes. Be proud of who you are. If those, there are people out there who don't understand you, it's their problem. And, you know, there are, we're here talking about social determinants of health, and this is why I'm saying that. Because there's too many, even like my own mother. She is embarrassed to have a brown face. Why? Because she was raised that way. Her parents taught her that. And who taught them that? I'm not pointing fingers of blame. I'm trying to help create social change. So I'm speaking to the youth in this room. It doesn't matter what color your face is. I want you to recognize that there is so much value that you carry in your genetic capacity. And you can bring it forth within you. So please, please appreciate our ancestors did not experience what they did for nothing, make it worth something. And so finally, I'm gonna culminate the principles of indigenous methodology by saying that they support the complexity that is necessary to combine all these different things, ontology, epistemology, axiology, and methodology. Again, not things common, in Western convention, but very much integral to the Native worldview. So why? Why, do, why would we choose indigenous or indigenous methodology? Sorry. Normally I would have it here, but my com computer's sitting here. I don't want to hit the wrong key. Why would we choose it? Well, first of all, back in the day, there really was no respect for Native people. There was a cultural dominance that came with Western integration, with manifest destiny. And so, you know, uh, what happened was Native peoples were used and abused. And you know, I know this is redundant. I know you've heard it. I've heard it myself many times throughout the course of this summit. Uh, that's 
the, you know, the downside of, of being the last to speak. But on the upside, I get the final word. <laughs> so um, the other reason why you would uh, use indigenous or indigenous methods um, is because many, much of the research that is done according to a Western paradigm lacks relevance to native people and to their communities and to their states of health. Look at, think about the apples and oranges once again. Um, you know, even, even, I'm a social scientist and I, I know that there are uh, uh, medical doctors and scientists in this room, but even at that, even according to biology and physiology, physiology, there are differences, and, and it makes a difference. You cannot study apples and do what's good for the apple and think that you're also serving oranges, because that's not necessarily true. So, you know, oh my gosh, see, so sorry. Uh, so anyway, um, you know, you need to make sure that you're relevant when you're doing research with indigenous people. Uh, and the last reason why you would use indigenous methodology, and you know, this is the last reason that I'm saying. It's not necessarily the last reason. There may be many other reasons, but these are the primary reasons that I'm bringing forward. Is it's about self-determination, and most importantly, it's about empowering, empowerment of a society that has long been disempowered. Let me give you a description of how the United States legal system sees indigenous people. These laws, by the way, are still on the books. They've not been changed. This is the wording. This is how indigenous people are described. First of all, the relationship that they have with the United States is considered remedial and paternalistic. They are considered to be uneducated, helpless, and dependent people needing protection against the selfishness of others and of their own improvidence. I don't think so, and that's why I say, you stand in your shoes and you let them know who you are. We've been around for a long time. We know what we're doing. But that, you know, that was impeded for far too long, and that's what indigenous methodologies are. They are emancipatory. You know, we're considered wards of this nation, and Hawaiians, you know, they're totally disenfranchised. Their sovereignty is not recognized at all. You know, and this is where so much of the things that have unfolded with Native peoples and their communities has uh, originated in this kind of thinking, in these kinds of paradigms. That's how indigenous methodologies came to be, and that's why they're necessary. I'm not saying it's still that way, although it is that way in some places, but this is, it's, it's repulsive. It really is. And to think that it's still out there, it's still the law of the United States and how Native people are recognized. Okay, so let's get to some shortcuts about uh, indigenous ethics and what you want to keep in mind ethically when you're conducting your indigenous research. We have the four R's, respect, relevance, reciprocity, and responsibility. Um, respect is, a, is very much a fundamental aspect of native culture. Not only do, are we expected to offer it in our relationships within ourselves in the Native community, 
but we generally extend it beyond our communities to other people, but it's not always perceived as that. Um, relevance, again, I mentioned relevance earlier. It needs to relate to what's going on in our communities. Reciprocity, this is one, um, again, very much a native value and culture. You know, Western world has a saying, Western society, give and take. But for natives, it's give and receive. Taking and receiving are two very different things. So reciprocity in indigenous research is about giving and receiving. So, you know, when you deal with native people, you don't come in there and say, well, I'm going to do this research study and I'm going to help you and, uh, so, and I'm giving you this. And so in return, this is what I want from you. It doesn't work that way. In return, you stand and wait and see what you are given. See what you are given, if anything at all. But that is the native way. Responsibility. Responsibility is also crucial because, you know, there's been too many broken trusts in doing research with Native people that, um, especially if you're a Native person engaging in research, you're a gatekeeper. You need to protect your people, your communities, your relatives. If you're non-native, you need to respect and you need to also protect those who have been abused for far too long. Advocate for them, help them. You want something from native communities, you'll get your return. That's our way. We always give, but it may not look like what you expect. So don't go in there with an expectation of a particular return. What? How did I? Sorry. Ah. Okay, so when it comes to indigenous research, what constitutes appropriate is determined by the protocols and ethics of the communities or individuals being researched. Don't generalize natives. There are over 500 federally recognized tribes and there are far more that aren't federally recognized, but they recognize their own identity as distinct cultures and peoples. Okay, so if you're going to do engage in research with a specific group of indigenous people, do it on their terms. Do it according to them, not from what you assume who they are, because that may, may not necessarily be the case. And there is another fundamental principle that says we are accountable towards those with, for, and on whom we are conducting the research. So ultimately, again, the responsibility falls to us. If anyone is harmed in any way, it's on the researcher. I don't know about you, but I like to sleep at night. Flip the coin, indigenous researchers have a responsibility to be accurate and truthful in their data. And don't try to make the data fit your hypothesis or your assumptions. Okay, we've got more R's here. Indigenous pedagogy. Rediscovering, respect, and recovering the culture. Beneath that, I have several values that I've listed that are part of that pedagogy and part of what you need to consider in the way you carry out your research. 
these are things that are fairly, you know, and I, I don't like to make generalizations about Native people, but these things are fairly consistent throughout across Native culture. The belief in the interconnectedness of all things, you know, the impact of motivations and intentions, research as a lived experience, Theoretical grounding in epistemology, meaning understand, understand who you're studying and, and what you're going in there about. It should also be transformative in nature. You know, I think therefore I am. I do because I can. These are Western paradigms. Native paradigms are about sustainability, about addressing what's needed, what's relevant, not just because I want to, I feel like it. Native people are also very spiritual, so they take research as a sacred responsibility. And you don't have to be Native to appreciate that aspect of it. Uh, and also, please, Recognize languages and cultures as a, as a living process. There are a number of canons of etiquette, most of them instated by indigenous peoples themselves as a way of being self-determining and as a way of maintaining the context of who they are. Um, one of those, well, two of those aspects are identity. Identity is very significant to Native peoples. Who they are is not just uh, their name, who they are is all the ancestors that came before them. It's the place where they're from. And all of these aspects about them contribute to everything that they are. Um, I don't know how to put it uh, more succinctly than that, but they, it's inextricable to, uh, to their person or their being. And again, the give and receive. With a native person, the belief is that you ask, if you ask anything of anyone, it's an imposition. You're taking from them. And so if you, if you have to, and there are circumstances where you do have to ask, you need to be willing and prepared to offer something in return. Okay. Relationships. Relationships are extremely important to Native people. And I'm not just talking about relationships with other people. I'm talking about relationships with the land, with the objects on the land, with the spirits, with everything. Everything is interconnected. So 